We are going to detail the evidence which shows how added sugars in our diet are contributing to obesity and diabetes. We're going to define and identify the characteristics of the various low and no calorie sweeteners that are currently available. We will interpret language and integrate new and existing scientific literature on the safety and efficacy of low and no calorie sweeteners in our decision-making process. And last, I hope to provide you information so that as you're teaching your clients and your patients, you will find ways to implement low and no calorie sweeteners into healthy eating patterns as a way of reducing added sugar intake. So let's get started. We are all being challenged by those trends and those rising rates of obesity and diabetes. Many people are now referring to this as diabetes. So if you take a look at the rates of obesity in the United States, now what we're looking at here are US adults. And you look, over the last 20 years, we've seen about a 12% increase or so in the rates of obesity in U.S. adults. 42% of U.S. adults are living with obesity. When we do a deeper dive into what we call severe obesity, often defined as a BMI of 40 or greater, you can see that that affects about 10% of all adults in the United States. To put this into perspective, a BMI of 40 means that that individual is approximately 100 pounds above a healthy weight zone. And both of these trends are rising. It shouldn't surprise you that if obesity is rising, so too is diabetes. If you look at the number of people in the United States with pre-diabetes, it's almost 100 million. That means one in every three adults has prediabetes. Folks, this does not bode well for us as a country. 11% of these individuals go on every year to develop diabetes if nothing changes. Again, those are staggering numbers. Well, obesity and diabetes are multifactorial. There are a number of reasons that people develop diabetes and obesity. One of the large, one of the big components related to both of these is certainly our diet. And a big component of that is the amount of sugar that Americans are consuming and that is in the average diet. You can see that the average adult in the United States is consuming about 250-ish calories from sugar and about 17 teaspoons of sugar a day. Well, the American diabetes excuse me, the Dietary Group for America uh, recommends that that number be reduced to less than 10% of our daily calories. They also recommend that less than 12 teaspoons of sugar are ingested daily in our diet. Well, the American Heart took it even further. The American Heart Association recommends limiting in sugars in our diet to under 6% of our calories. That means less than nine teaspoons a day and less than six teaspoons a day, uh, not less than nine in men and less than six teaspoons a day in women. So where are all of these sugars in our diets coming from? Number one is sugar sweetened beverages. And this includes coffee and tea. About 35% of the sugars in our diet come from these liquid beverages. You've all seen these franchises, these coffee houses, where some of these drinks that people are consuming have 20 and 30 teaspoons of sugar and have over a thousand calories in one drink. Now, certainly there are other places where sugars come from, but you can see those sugar sweetened beverages lead the charge. So I talked with you a little bit about that MAFLD, that metabolic associated fatty liver disease. Take a look at this pathway to the development of inflammation and even fibrosis in, in the liver. And if you take a look, when patients ingest fructose, otherwise known as sugar, there are multiple ways that this fructose increases adipose tissue, which increases insulin resistance. It, you can also see that that fructose contributes to gut microbiome dysbiosis, and it increases oxidative stress, leading to inflammation as well as fibrosis in the liver. By the way, metabolic liver disease is now the number one reason in the United States
for people to need a liver transplant. So this is not a benign condition. One of the things that we can bring to the table are low and no calorie sweeteners and give these patients an option for substituting out the sugars in their diet for products that can help to reduce that sugar consumption and even calories. So continuing on with this survey, they also looked at what are the top reasons that people are using low and no calorie sweeteners? And the number one reason was, I wanna to try to limit or avoid sugar. Number two was they wanted to save calories and about 34% actually believe that sugar is not good for them. What's disappointing to me is 26% said my healthcare provider recommended that I avoid sugar. I believe that these are conversations that we need to have with our patients, not just for themselves, but patients who have, who have children, because we, we know that there, that there is a plethora of information out there about the impact of sugars in their diet. So let's take a look at the variety of sweeteners that we have available. So when you're looking at a label and you're helping patients to interpret that label, when you see sucrose, when you see fructose, you need to know that that product is flavored with sugar. We have sweeteners that have been designated by the FDA as food additives. We'll talk about that in a moment. Sucralose, the active ingredient in Splenda is one of them. You've got aspartame and saccharin as well. The rage these days are some of these plant-based and fruit-based sweeteners, products like Steviol or, uh, and monk fruit. We'll talk a little bit about those in a second. And then there are other types of sweeteners. The one I do wanna call your attention to are what we call sugar alcohol and sugar alcohols. You've heard of xylitol and sorbitol over the years, but today we're also going to talk about a product called erythritol as well. So let's talk about the safety of low and no calorie sweeteners. And before I get into the safety, I think it's important for you to understand that the FDA regulates these products. They do regulate low and no calorie sweeteners. And based on their review, they're going to either be designated as a food additive or what we call generally regarded as safe. I'm gonna to refer to that as grass. Let's talk about the differences. So for a product to be designated as a food additive, it's going to undergo a pre-market review and approval by the FDA before it can be used in foods. The FDA is going to look at short and long-term toxicity studies, its carcinogenic potential and reproductive toxicity studies. There are six products, including sucralose, aspartame, xylitol, et cetera, that have been designated as a food additive. But not every low and no calorie sweetener is designated as a food additive. It's also possible for them to be designated as grass. And so what is this? It is, they do not have to undergo that pre-market approval, but what still has to happen is a panel of experts who are trained in this domain are going to all come together and look at the literature that is currently available and the studies that are available and to look at those studies to identify, is this product safe to use under the conditions of its intended use? And there are a number of different products that are designated as grass as well. So the take home st story here is whether they are a food additive or they are designated as a grass product, they are both FDA approved and must meet safety standards before they are allowed to be added in to products that we will all use. So in totality, the evidence in one statement that low no calorie sweetened products are a safe tool that can be used as part of a comprehensive approach to weight loss and weight maintenance, but should not be thought of as the complete answer or the complete approach in and of itself. It is part of a healthy life or healthy eating pattern. So let's talk now in our last few minutes about implementing low, no calorie sweeteners into a healthy eating pattern. The ADA says, we want people to maintain the pleasure of eating. So much of what we do 
revolves around food. It's part of our family. It's part of our culture. We don't want to take away the pleasure of eating. However, at, we should continue to provide positive messages regarding food choice while limiting food choices only when are indicated by scientific evidence. That people with diabetes should be given practical tools. And I would even say people with pre-diabetes and those who are overweight or obese as well should be given practical tools for day-to-day -day meal planning. Thank you for watching this webinar preview. My name is Julie Cullen, the Managing Editor of American Nurse Journal. I invite you to watch the full version of this free on-demand webinar. Just follow the link in the description. You can also visit myamericannurse.com for a full collection of our free webinars. Thank you.